going to sit here and uh, enjoy a little bit more learning. So I'm going to invite Tema to uh, continue the conversation and we'll ask questions after she gives us a little uh, continued presentation. And we'll have a time for a little bit more Q&A and go a little bit deeper with her. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to invite uh, Tema back. Here we are. I feel like now we're in our Rabinovitz social hall, Tema. That's our social hall. So we've moved from the sanctuary to the social hall. And uh, we invite you to uh, continue with your wonderful words of teaching. I feel like when I do this, where it goes from like services to uh, like kiddish discussion, I should move my laptop to the living room or something. <laughs> like, that, you know, that sort of sense of moving from one space to another. Um, obviously that is not a thing that I have done yet, um, but I will say I enjoyed part of the Shabbat services on my iPad um, and then switched to my laptop for the Torah service, um, which felt like some sort of a division of space. I'm not really sure. The other thing that I just have to say about these Zoom services, that <laughs> this is a very funny thing, but it it's very meaningful to me. I am not a morning person and being able to drink my coffee while attending Shabbat services is something that I will be very sad to lose. <laughs> so, I, I don't know. I, I drink it black. I feel like we should petition that if it's not going to wreck the floors with like sour milk somehow that we should be able to drink our coffee at Shul. That's, that's my, that'll be my new cause. <laughs> so we're definitely going to raise this with the, uh, with the beautification committee. So we'll let you know. Yeah. I mean, if it's carpeted, I guess it gets a little complicated because coffee does stain, but you know, where it isn't carpeted or where the carpets are, all, the carpets are already stained beyond belief, then maybe it works. I know. I don't know when the carpet was last done at Holy Blossom, but um, it was not recently. I can tell you that much. So, um, yeah, we're getting new carpeting, so I'm afraid we're going to have to hold off on the coffee. Yeah. Well, one thing I am going to warn you now also is that my dogs have been being very good, which means that we are due for insanity anytime now. So if I look like I'm looking off screen or I mute suddenly or like I literally just jump and run it's because I have a seven month old puppy who has a magical way of getting into everything and is so small he fits under all the furniture so it's like a new level of chaos right now um, so without further ado um I actually ended up talking about a lot of the text that I was hoping to bring um to this conversation um in my sermon which I wasn't actually intending to do until I started going back over my notes um, this morning and things, you know, sometimes you sleep on it and then everything falls into place differently. Um, so I'm trying to sort of pull a few more things out um, and I, I really hope we can have a fairly robust conversation and questions and answers because that's my preferred way to teach is to teach and learn at the same time. And I'm always really grateful to be in community where people um, offer a lot of themselves in, in these conversations because I've learned so much by talking about these things um, in, in spaces that I don't get to go into often. You know, when you talk to the same people about the same thing, um, it doesn't always sort of like light up new, new lights for you. Um, so I wanna draw on uh, the piece that I shared, I believe you received that I wrote for the forward. Um, I've been thinking a lot really in light of what has been happening over the last long time. Um, but so we remember last last winter, Hanukkah into January of last year, which feels like a lifetime ago, there was a really um, disturbing uptick in violent attacks on Jews in Brooklyn, predominantly also New Jersey um, by, by Black people with whom they shared neighborhoods. Um, and it really got me thinking because what I saw happening in response to this over and over and over was some pretty virulent racism from Jewish people. Um, and from people who also, maybe virulent isn't the right word in this case, but from people who espouse sort of the values of Black Lives Matter, the values of saying racial justice, the values of saying, you know, we understand um, what racism is and looks like. But at the same time, 
when it came to sort of seeing where a threat to um, the Jew, the orth it was the sort of ultra orthodox Jewish community in this case, um, when that when looking at that threat, um, sort of I don't want to say a siege mentality, but kind of fell back into this everyone's out to get us and therefore we can't trust or put ourselves out there. And so as I do, um, my, as you know, my background is as an academic in um, religion and politics, but actually what that was, was um, a fancy way of saying that I read a lot of Jewish philosophy and that was political political thought, 20th, 20th century political thought, um, and was trying to tie it back to Jewish sources. Um, so just to give some context for that, um, I, as a young undergrad, um, had not actually had any formal Jewish learning, but had a lot of informal sort of cultural Jewish learning and just kept being like, these concepts are coming up in every Jewish philosopher that I read and they're really resonant with me. Like what's going on here? So I started asking those questions and sort of went on that path. Um, so really my, my go-to in any moment is to um, go to sources, um, read text. Um, the joke my mother always makes is that she doesn't know, like I was just born super Jewish because this is what I've been like my whole life. Like I have a question, I like read every text that has ever been written about the thing and then feel like I can't comment because I haven't finished reading all the text and I ask a million questions and that sort of way, of, that's my way of processing it. Um, and at that moment I went back to um, actually a book that I'm going to wheel myself over and pull out because I love it. this book that was on my parents' bookshelf when I was growing up. Um, Black Anti-Semitism and Jewish Racism. Um, it includes, it was published in 1969 uh, for, for the first time, um, but on Shokin Press, so a Jewish, a Jewish press. And it was introduced by Nat Hanshoff from The Village Voice. And it includes that essay that I referenced um, from James Baldwin, um, although that's not the first place it was printed. It also includes a number of pieces um, from rabbis. Um, Julius Lester, who is a black Jew is included in this volume, which is like fairly rare for a Jewish text of that age to include the voice of a Jew of color um, and, and other black leadership. And what really struck me as I was reading it is that the entire conversation we were having last winter was being had in that book from 69. So that's like 50 years earlier. And to make matters even more sad, I guess that's the word I'm looking for, discouraging, was that one of the, one of the essays in the book, um, the guy refers back to a sermon given at um, whatever Hebrew Union College used to be called, I always get it wrong, United UAH, the Reform Rabbinical School in Cincinnati in I think the, the late 20s or in the 30s. And he said, see, this could have been written right now, but it actually wasn't. It was written 30, 30 40 years prior. So we're having the same conversation on a loop. And why I found that reassuring was on the one hand, we have tools. When we go back to our sources, we have tools to have this conversation that were being created by earlier generations. Um, on the other hand, it was very disturbing to me that literally every word I was reading in this book could apply to 2019. Not literally every word because they talk about specifics and they talk about the school board stuff and you know all of the things that were causing rifts between the black community and the Jewish community at the time. And I was reading, um, I read very closely the words of um, Al Vorspan, um, who is actually my friend, my the late Al Vorspan was my one of my close friends' grandfather, um, and he was very sarcastic already. He was very cynical um, about the work to be done. And in my article, I quote from him quite, quite liberally. Um, and what then we move on into, um, you know, everything that's happened after George Floyd. 
And one of the things that keeps coming up, and, and um, actually one of the things that keeps coming up for me with that, um, in a piece that I wrote, the only piece I've written actually since George Floyd, because I've just felt really like the weight of all of this in a way that has stopped me from writing. Um, not, not the greatest thing for a columnist, but that's where we are. Um, but I, there was a piece, everyone quotes that one line from Martin Luther King um, about a riot being the language of the unheard. Um, but what they don't quote is that he goes on to explain why people are unheard. And people talk a lot about his letter from the Birmingham jail um, and how it's really an, uh, an address to the white moderate. So the person who is not racist, um, who is white and believes in equality, um, but isn't actually standing up to make the change. And I think about that a lot um, as I talk more and more and more and more and more within the Jewish community. And this isn't like calling anyone out, that's not at all how I mean it. But the line um, between comfort and pushing ourselves, and I count myself in this, by the way, and I think that that's a, a real tension, is comfort and putting yourself in danger is a very hard line to cross. And when I think of the way that sort of we look at the pictures of Heschel marching next to King. Um, I heard Susanna Heschel speak um, on a panel a couple days ago. Uh, the Forward uh, hosted an MLK panel. Um, it was with Susanna Heschel. Um, it was with Mark Dollinger who wrote um, the brilliant book, uh, Black Power Jewish Politics. Highly recommend it if civil rights era history is your kind of a thing. He really interestingly looks at the history of the time, but also looks at something that people don't tend to look at, which is the impact of the black power movement on Jewish identity. Um, and people tend to see that as like the source of the rift, but he actually looks at how um, inspiration was taken, um, especially in terms of like, I mean, a good example is the, the sort of ways that Zionism changed um, after the late sixties in, in American Jewry. Um, so really interesting book, highly recommend. Um, but the two of them sort of, were really committed to blowing up the myth that Jews all marched with MLK. Um, Susanna Heschel said, you know, this was like dangerous for her father. This was not like something he took on lightly. It was something he took on because he felt morally obligated. And we only have to look as far as the um, men who were murdered trying to register voters in Mississippi <laughs> to understand that danger. Um, and so when I think about the moment we're at and why this keeps coming back to me now is what happened on the Capitol last week. Um, I live in Toronto, as you've probably figured out, I am also American. Um, I live here, um, I was born and raised here, but the reason that my parents came back here <laughs> was um, it was the racism and economic disparities of the US. They lived in New York at the time. They were in their mid twenties neither come from families with money. They were like living in a really bad apartment in Alphabet City in the late 70s in New York City. If you know New York City from the from the late 70s and into the 80s, you kind of get the picture. If you don't, if you've ever seen Rent, that's Alphabet City like a decade later. Um, so, you know, that kind of gives you the, the sort of sense of where they were living. And my mom said, I, I can't do this anymore. Um, and you know, was actually actively scared to leave her home. And they moved back and they moved to Canada, my father followed. And so it was actually in many ways, an escape from the overt signs of systemic racism that pushed my family to Canada. And I'm an American citizen, I vote. I spend, normally I spend a considerable amount of the year uh, south of the border. I miss you all. It feels very weird to be like literally kind of locked out of the country. I mean, you can drive it. It's complicated. Like you can go, but like, first of all, stay at home orders are a good thing. Number one, I'm putting that out there. Um, but also it's just that it's just psychologically, it feels very strange to know that the border is closed. Um, but for me, I'm facing up to things like the choice to be safe in Canada 
where yes we do have st structural racism and systemic racism but like i enjoy a nice middle class life i'm in a place with universal health care and you know less of an less of a stark contrast um between uh, one thing that I, I would be remiss if i didn't mention is uh we do have severe systemic racism in Canada. It's just predominantly towards Indigenous peoples here. Um, probably similar in the U.S., except for I think in the U.S. it's a little bit more out of sight, out of mind. Whereas in Canada, it's like in your face, even in the cities. Um, so I think you know there's that there's that piece of it. Um, but when we really spend time and grapple um, with what we are doing to pursue justice. Um, I want to encourage all of us, myself included, to spend time grappling with what it means to choose safety over fighting. I don't know what that looks like. That's actually probably not something I would have said to you um, before last Wednesday. Um, but watching what I watched last Wednesday, watching hearing i had cnn on like constantly and they said um they were talking about something yesterday it was kind of in the background but essentially what they said was that they couldn't weed through um whether it was a credible threat or not a credible threat or whether it was just bluster um and you know hearing um i think it was during don lemon's segment um but hearing him say like are black people given the benefit of the doubt like like that <laughs> if, if if a bunch of Black people tweeted that they were going to storm the Capitol, would we be giving them the same benefit of the doubt? So I'm really processing a lot. And these are all hypotheticals and they're fundamentally unanswerable. Um, but at the same time, when we look through instances of American history, um, I think we have our answer. So I'm going to leave with one sort of final thought um, and then hopefully we can have a pretty robust conversation. And like I said, like, I don't have answers. I, I want to put that right out there. I, I don't have answers. This is all stuff that I am processing um, and that I am grappling with um, on so many levels um, as a Jewish professional, as somebody who is uh, mixed race but passes for white in most spaces. There are so many layers of this for me. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, when I think about, I, I watched over the summer, um, the Chicago 8, is it the Chicago 8 or the Chicago 7? It was Chicago 8, and then they split off one case. And, um, but, you know, reading through the history of Fred Hampton um, being killed, um, thinking through sort of other instances of that in our history, and the mythologies that have built up around um, both Jewish involvement in civil rights, the breakdown in those movements, what black power has looked like, the risk to the Jewish community from the black community. There are so many intertwined um, mythologies. And I use the word mythology sort of to mean um, there's a kernel of truth and then a whole bunch of historical memory that surrounds it. And historical memory is of course how you want to remember it. Um, and so as we are building, uh, historical memory, and as we are fighting for racial justice, which you're all here, it's obviously something you all care about. Um, I just want to encourage you at every moment to spend that time sitting in the discomfort of recognizing um, all of the ways in which these situations, these um, discrepancies, these disparities, um, the structural racism that we live in impacts all of us. Um, and to really take seriously the idea that, um, you know, we are not, none of us are free until all of us are free. Um, but also to go back to Jewish text, uh, that we were all created in the image of God. And so any, um, and Heschel actually talks about this a lot in that piece, um, an assault on any individual in any way um, is essentially blasphemy. And I just want to leave with one line um, from Heschel. He says, so this conference was called um, Religion and Race. And in his introduction, he says, um, perhaps the conference should have been called religion or race. You cannot worship God and at the same time look at man as if he were a horse. And I love that. He 
takes this idea very seriously that actually not engaging in the fight to root out racism and he does go down into structural what we would now call structural racism not engaging in that fight is blasphemy um he actually like uses language of satanism like it, it's it's i was actually shocked to read that language um but it is very sort of stark um and so he and one final line from heschel he says how many disasters do we have to go through in order to realize that all of humanity has a stake in the liberty of one person? Whether one, per what, whenever one person is offended, we are all hurt. What begins as in inequality of some inevitably ends as inequality of all. Mm. So I want to end with that thought from Heschel. Mm. Thank you so much, Tema. Um, so we, uh, we actually want to open it up and just as if we were all sitting in, I don't know, the Rabinovitz or Swope Chapel, uh, have a conversation, have a little Q&A. Um, if you want to share a comment, just try to not make it too long so that there's space for all of us who are here. So if you would just raise your hand physically, I will just go around and try to call on people and get us all involved in the conversation and create some intimate space. So let's just imagine we're all in the same room together and learning because in a way we are. Uh, I'll start it off with Tony and then we'll go around the room and, and give everyone an opportunity over. Um, I, first, I just have a very simple question. The first line that you quoted just now from Heschel, I did not hear the end of it. Oh, I, don't know. I think yeah. maybe other people didn't either because so could you repeat that? Um, Perhaps this conference should have been called religion or race. You cannot worship God and at the same time look at man as if he were a horse. A horse, okay. Well, I was very sad to hear that you don't have answers because I, it's been a long, I, I've been fighting this issue since I was a child. I've been um, aware of it. Um, I was in California as a little kid when they took the Japanese people that were our friends and put them in an internship. And there was an openness in Southern California that I think was a, uh, the, and my family was very open about um, other people, others, all others. And uh, New York seemed like that when I got to New York when I was six. But it really wasn't. <laughs> and that over time was something that um, I learned. My mother worked with a couple of women from the Caribbean and um, they were, that's how, you know, they were our friends. And the, but they faced all kinds of, of obstacles. And it's just been, a, I have protested endless times and I've, I've been, gotten very discouraged because it's as you said you know the, that article that was written in 1930 could have been written today it was the same thing similar very similar and the the idea of, of that black people in particular have a harder time because it's so easy to spot them and i mean and they're they're being spotted all the time i mean if someone go if a black person goes to a bar mitzvah, they they other people think they are work there as a caterer or something. You know they don't. That's their first thought. I mean that's still going on today. And yeah. It's terrible. What so. I will say, I may not have answers, but I sometimes have insights. <laughs> um, I want to. Sometimes I do have an answer, sometimes it's straightforward, but 95% of the time, even if I don't have an answer, I will have some sort of an insight. Um, and, you know, just to sort of situate myself again, um, when I say this is like my family business, um, my mother is a social worker and a psychotherapist whose doctoral research was on mixed race families. Um, my father uh, was the director of equity for the city of Toronto. Um, my cousin heads up the Innocence Project. Like this is literally the family business. This is what we do. Um, so whether it's something that I've learned, um, people always ask me, how did you learn this stuff? And I was like, I, 
I don't think I actually ever learned it. This is just what we talked about at the dining room table. Um, so um, sometimes, you know, just that sort of insight of being um, present in a different way with this stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I really appreciate that you mentioned um, the Japanese people, because Canada, of course, did the same thing. Um, and we're still dealing with legacies of trauma from that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a tragedy um, what what happened there um, as well. You know, of course, there's the Chinese who came to build the, the railroads. Um, and in Canada, they actually got paid back the head tax like that. I don't know if the US did the same thing, but there was like actually reparations for it, which is probably a good thing. Um, and by probably, I mean, absolutely a good thing. Um, and, you know, in, in a past life, I jokingly say, before I started working in synagogues, um, and now I, I worked on a Holocaust Ed project, but the focus of our project was actually to, project is one of my Canadian words, you'll hear, you'll hear a handful of those. Um, <laughs> every time I'm like, oh, I said project again. Um, but um, one of the, one of our focuses was actually to um, elucidate these stories of immigration restriction that came before Jews were barred from Canada in the Holocaust, um, and then talk about all the ways that they play out now. So Canada, of course, we're much more open to immigrants, but um, yeah. that's part of our care, our national character. That's like the whole thing we do. Um, but at the same time, um, through restrictions about what kind of a temporary worker can change their visa to a permanent status and things like that, it's still a very racialized system. And we use a point system, like you get more points for having money, you get more points for speaking English, you get more points, all of these things to get into the country. Um, so really thinking about those pieces as well. And, and the hard thing is not to get overwhelmed in all of the places structural racism shows up and in how intractable it is. Um, and I think that's, you know, what you're really pointing to when you say like, oh. we've been protesting this for a long time. Um, and the one thing I will say I am encouraged about is hearing more people at a government level talking about how economic structures feed this. You cannot talk about structural racism in America, in Canada, in the UK, anywhere, without talking about the way our economy is structured um, and who has wealth and who doesn't. Um, so that is giving me like a kernel of hope. I don't think structural racism is being undone in like one presidential term or even two uh, or even 10, but beginning to have that conversation I think is since in the last decade, I've seen it more and more and no more so than in um, over the summer and leading up to the election. So small kernels of hope. Yes, those protests this summer with Nick people of, of every ethnic group. So. Let's get uh, our next voice over to Arlene. Wonderful. <clears throat> Hi, uh, thank you, Tema. I really enjoyed your, what you talked about today. My question you might have already answered. I was going to ask if racism against Indigenous peoples in Canada is structural like it is here. And it, it, I think you already answered that. Um, yes, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it and I'll make sure. Um, I'm trying to remember what I'm saying I'm sending a link to. But McLean's Magazine, which is kind of like Newsweek, except for like more liberal, um, it's like the Canadian Newsweek, had an article in the first wave of Black Lives Matter protests, like back in 2014, I think it was, that was basically like Canadians stop being so smug by every measure Indigenous people in Canada are worse off than Black people in the US. It's egregious. Um, we have numerous, part of it is also the geography that you have these like remote communities um, that are in just, there's no, my mother has actually spent time in a community in the far north um, and she always says to me, like, there's, you just cannot actually imagine the poverty unless you're there. Like, you're talking about entire large families living in a single room house with severe substance abuse problems. Um, you know, some of our northern communities still don't have potable drinking water and haven't since the 70s. Um, you know, just crumbling infrastructure. And one of the things that keeps coming up 
this time, this pandemic is um, they're actually tracking what's going on in indigenous communities, thank God. Um, but when the H1N1 uh, epidemic happened, Health Canada responded by sending body bags to indigenous communities. I wish I was joking. Um, they were like, oh, sorry, it was an error. <laughs> like, <Oy>. uh, um, <laughs> But not great. Really not great. There's a lot of hands up, so we're trying to give everyone a chance. We'll go from Paul over to Barbara, Ruth, then Lou, and then Stephanie. I have to. Okay. Um, so, Tema, thank you so much. Um, so, I wanted to follow up to a couple things. One, you, you talked about how our safety is tied up with racial justice, the only way to deal with anti Semitism is to address the root causes of injustice for everyone. And I also think about um, the way that uh, racist attitudes and ideas are so pervasive in our society that we, we've all internalized racism. And I, I, I would say, I think that's true to some extent of um, anti-Semitism, that, that, that to some extent anti-Semitism is pervasive and we even, you know, even Jews have internalized um, some of that. Anyway, I wonder if you could just say more about what you see as the root causes of injustice and how anti-Semitism and racism are linked, that it's in our own interest really to be allies. Um, sure. Um, so Baldwin in a lot of ways has been my teacher on this. Um, so of course the the sort of roots of systemic anti-black racism in the U.S. are so well documented. Um, but you know, in a nutshell, you free a bunch of slaves, um, leave them in the country um, next to the slave owners, who um, some of whom have been compensated for the slaves being freed. Um, the slaves themselves have not. Um, they've now also lost their source of free labor, um, and so have to reorganize. And this is why I say you can't talk about any of this without talking about the economy um, and the way that our that our systems are structured like you just cannot um, because that is that that was the root that's what slavery is about um like it's about finding a group to subjugate in the interest of labor of like being free labor I, I mean even the reality is even when we read exodus right like that's that's how Jews ended up enslaved in Egypt too to build the we probably didn't actually build the pyramids. There's evidence that we didn't, but you know, at least in the story to build the pyramids and do the hard labor for free. Um, so this is of course the root. And of course what predates that is the um, system of sort of what we would now call overt racism that like dehumanizes black people into um, workhorses. Um, ideas don't just disappear, <laughs> they, they shift. Um, but also, you know, when we talk about the origins of policing, they, the origins of American policing, if you haven't read m up much on this, and I have only like skimmed, like sort of touched the surface of this, but the origins of American policing were in the uh, patrols that would go to uh, capture escaped slaves. Um, and so you have like this confluence of essentially a, an attempt to reorganize an existing power structure into a different power structure that keeps the same people in power. So in a nutshell, eventually a system just keeps propagating itself and you don't ask too much about it. Like, I don't think any of us were really like, hey, how did policing in America start? That's not a question. It, it's just, you know, of course there are police. Um, and so you don't really ask too many questions. Um, what has happened, I think, as um, more legislation has been put in place around, um, like voting protection, although Voting Rights Act, of course, was gutted, but looking at all of these pieces um, that start to level this level the playing field a little bit here has have resulted in pushback. And I don't think that the other piece that you can't look at this without is power analysis. People want to control their own destiny in a way that's good for them, for the most part. That's also partially why, like doing this kind of justice work, it feels uncomfortable and dangerous because it's, it's not actually about us. And I think that a lot of the time when people bristle about the language of um, privilege, it's because we imagine that there's an infinite amount of pie to go around or a finite amount of pie to go around. And if we give up some of ours, or if, if 
we sort of try to work so that priv white privilege isn't a thing, that somehow we are lessening what we have, whereas really liberation philosophy, uh, liberation philosophy, which is where this comes from, is actually that there isn't a finite amount of pie. There's an infinite amount of pie. We just think it's a finite amount of pie. Um, so just sort of tying a whole bunch of things together. Anti-Semitism, I think we can't talk about with understanding Christian anti-Semitism. Um, the history, like all the way through, the, the threads that run through. Um, but one of the, and this is where I say Baldwin is my teacher, um, one of the historical positions Jews has held, have held is as essentially middlemen. Um, you know, we um, were the money lenders because Christians weren't allowed to collect interest. So like, it's not really in your interest to loan people money if you've got nothing coming back to you. So Jews ended up doing that merchants because that was something that we could do even without um, sort of the rights that others in, in our societies before we landed here were afforded. And so when Baldwin talks about Harlem, and I think, you know, this is very real, and I felt it really acutely with the conversations last year, is that we as Jews haven't done a great job of reckoning with how we've been sort of pushed into roles, but how we occupy roles, that a lot of the people living in Crown Heights have Jewish landlords. Um, and so the only people that they are encountering who are Jews are people who they feel take advantage of them. And that's really what Baldwin talks about. Um, and that doesn't really make anything easier, um, but I think it gives us a little bit of, and, and then of course, like there's just Nazi anti-Semitism that, unfortunately is becoming mainstreamed through like QAnon stuff. Um, and I use Nazi sort of broadly because of course it was also uh, czarist propaganda and like everything in between about Jews running the world and Jews controlling the media and like all of these pieces um, is unfortunately becoming mainstreamed. But that to me just says that there's even more at stake for us to sort of really like hunker down in uncomfortable conversations. Um, there's a line that I don't think I read from Baldwin before and I'm gonna apologize um, if I did, um, that just like made me laugh because if you've never watched videos of Baldwin speaking, I highly recommend you do because then every time you read his essays, you hear it in his voice and he has a very unique way of speaking. And this one line I just heard him saying, and it's, a genuinely candid confrontation between American Negroes and American Jews would certainly prove of inestimable, inestimable value, but the aspirations of the country are wretchedly middle class and the middle class can never afford candor. I love this line. I just tweeted it out because I was just like, it made me laugh because it's so perfect. And like, I'm, I live in Canada, like we're all super like polite, sort of that, that that's our values. Um, so it made me laugh on a whole other level. Um, but I think, you know, just thinking through some of those pieces and like, what does it mean to chip away at um, that sort of value that actually does make it harder to have hard conversations? Um, and number one, and number two, and this again, is that that tension between wanting to show up and feeling unsafe. Um, and I don't mean physically unsafe in this in this case like no if you're physically unsafe like get get out unless you're the kind of person who like really wants to stare down nazis which i don't think is most of us um but you know that that uh, the sort of emotional risk um of putting ourselves out there to hear uncomfortable things and again i include myself in this i have had to have very hard conversations over my life um with people who are black but darker than me um, about the ways in which it is uncomfortable for them in some cases when I speak as somebody who is mixed race because I can walk through this world as white. And I've explicitly chosen not to. I have, I mean, obviously, um, but, um, you know, I was raised not to, not to sort of sit back um, and sort of let myself rest on this structure that like, says white skin is good and everything else. Um, I've written about that too. You can go find that in the forward uh, about the difference, why I think that Jews calling themselves white passing is icky for me, um, but I've, I've spoken about that a little bit. Um, so, but there is real emotional discomfort that comes from it. And as humans, we don't wanna feel emotionally attacked. Um, and so I think, you know, some of it is actually really 
testing our testing how far we can push our own human nature um, in service of pursuing justice. I hope that helps. Um, like I said, I have insights, but not answers. Yeah, thank you, Tema. No, that was, I, think, I think you addressed a lot in that. Thank you. We're gonna keep going around the room, try to get as many people in. So we've got uh, Barbara and then uh, Ruth and then Lou, and then keep going over to Stephanie and Joyce. So Tema, I'd like to, first of all, acknowledge you for the way you talked about black anti-Semitism. You didn't, as I've seen in other settings, minimize it, say that it was just on the fringe, encourage us not to worry about it. You really said it's there, it's there. Um, so then there's the question of how we respond to it. And you've challenged the group of people here to, you know, even despite the discomfort in, you know, understand that the role that privilege and our privilege has in forming it to engage in dialogue. But there's a large, I would say a fairly large segment of the Jewish community that for understandable reasons sees anti-Semitism anywhere and goes into self-protection mode. And I was wondering if you could provide some insight in you know, how, how to talk to those Jews who are more concerned with protecting ourselves, you know, not, not engaging with anybody who in any way has shown any anti-Semitism. Um, yes, that's the thing I think of often. And I just have to read one line from Baldwin because I think it goes um, to um, how I think many in the black community see this. Um, he writes, one does not wish, in short, to be told by an American Jew that his suffering is as great as the American Negro's suffering. It isn't, and one knows that it isn't from the very tone in which he assures you that it is. Um, Baldwin is very, like, he, like, straddles that line of, like, being serious and facetious at the same time in a way. This is why I say he's the prophet. Um, this is a struggle that I have. Um, I've worked in the Jewish community, like I said, um, for my entire professional career. And I spend a lot of time in rooms, uh, I'll use the example of Black Lives Matter, um, of people saying, oh, Black Lives Matter, we can't show up because they're anti-Israel and therefore anti-Semitic. And what the siege mentality is real, like it comes from trauma. And that's one of the reasons that I don't minimize this in any way, shape or form. The one thing that I will say that Jews just like, we've just got to stop freaking out about Louis Farrakhan, like for the love of God, it gives him more power. And I think this is like, um, it's interesting, Mark Dollinger, I haven't finished this part of the book yet, but he talks a little bit about the ADL's approach to the nation of Islam in the 60s. Um, which was basically to be in dialogue with them, because um, recognizing that every time we all yell, um, it actually is proving his point, um, which is a perverse way to look at it. But the reality is he's railing against the white man and the Jew as like the ultimate white man. And then we all stand there and yell, he's an anti-Semite, how could he say these things? Blah, blah, blah. And it just gives power because then he, it looks even more like he's speaking truth to power when we manage to get somebody fired from TV for parroting one of his lines. So, you know, it's, and that's a really hard thing to do. Um, and again, I'm gonna go back to root causes. The reason that he has any power at all is because he stepped into the South side of Chicago to provide things that were not there. That is the whole reason that he has power because Nation of Islam was going into jails and educating poor, uneducated Black men who then were indoctrinated, they're cults, I mean, were indoctrinated into the nation of Islam. So that was a little bit of an aside. As far as speaking to uh, the Jewish community and people within our community, I think that it's, for me, at least what it has been, has been a lot of like acknowledging um, the realness of our trauma and hurt and fear and I think especially now, like anti-Semitism like was the worst year on record last year, I think, which probably means this year as well, except for we were all locked in our houses. So, um, 
but you know, over the last few years, we've seen a really alarming rise in violent anti-Semitism as well. Um, and that's real. For me, I think where it becomes an interesting question is what spaces do we bring that conversation into and for what purposes? So, so often I will see people show up to a racial justice conversation wanting to talk about anti-Semitism. I say, build that relationship. And this is sort of what I've been coaching Jews on a little bit over, over the course of doing this work is, we're not gonna have that conversation, number one, if we refuse to go into the room because somebody once said a thing or somebody is anti-Israel or, 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 there's no conversation. At that point, we're just standing outside the building with a placard yelling at, at a closed room that's gonna not take us seriously at all. We need to be at the table, number one. Number two, we need to be at the table and with the cause at hand first in mind, and then eventually as we build these relationships and alliances, explaining the, the sort of commonalities. We also need to get better versed in our own history and our own positionality in America. Um, because yes, I hear this all the time, you know, the synagogue I work at and now belong to, and I'm chairing our uh, diversity, equity, inclusion committee is a very wealthy congregation. We just had a $31 million renovation. So what happens when this group starts yelling, well, Jews are attacked too, to a group of people who don't own a home, have no hope of home ownership, are being hit the hardest by the pandemic because they're in frontline service uh, jobs and are living in apartments with multiple families in them. It just doesn't line up in the way that I think we want it to um, when we walk into a room sort of foregrounding our own struggle. And I think there are moments, what I've been sort of really trying to do when I talk to Jewish groups is sort of say, the anti-Semitism piece is so real and we need to create Jewish spaces to work through it together and work through the pain and trauma together. Um, I had the, that course that I mentioned, that six week course, I had the privilege of doing it with 15, like 25 to 35 year old Jews in Toronto over six weeks. Um, and like there were tears. I mean, it was a really emotional process for all of us. Um, and, and we had hard conversations about race and racism and understanding positionality and understanding social location and understanding, you know, that our lives look very different than some of the spaces that we enter where we do encounter anti-Semitism or, um, you know, the, the sort of anti-Israel stuff that crosses the line into anti-Semitism. Um, I hope that helps. Like, I don't think, this is one of the hardest things. I think it's being comfortable knowing when the time is to speak about ourselves, um, number one. And number two, um, creating spaces for ourselves to actually process this really important and hard stuff without putting it on another community that we're ostensibly showing up to, to be allies to. Thank you so much, Tema. We'll continue around. Uh, I believe Ruth was next and then Lou then Stephanie, and then Joyce. Thank you, Tema. This has all been very, very interesting. Thanks for being with us. Um, my question and comment really follows up on what Barbara was touching on. And it's really that issue of um, when the siege mentality is so strong among Jews, what are sort of the most effective straightforward ways in a conversation, not necessarily in a large um, dedicated study session or symposium. What's, what's the way that lay people in conversation can convey most effectively the basic principle that, you know, we're not safe until we're all safe. Um, I find this comes up with Israelis who tend to be irritated that American Jewish intellectuals and university people seem to be able to speak so eloquently about Black Lives Matter, but not be able to denounce anti-Semitism on the campuses. You know, they, they, they just sort of say like, we're, we're sick and tired of American academia, often Jewish leadership is running these places, not able to talk about anti-Semitism, but able to talk about 
the injustices of, of racism for African Americans and people of color. Yeah, I mean, this is a, str a struggle that I have and I've been lucky to create spaces um, to have conversations. Um, but I think a few of the things, one is I'm a big proponent of the like principle of why questions where you just keep asking why until you get to a root cause and then you address it. Um, and sometimes and addressing it and you know affirming in, in that process you know the, the real feelings that are there um number one the other thing though is and this is like i think it comes across as very harsh sometimes but i think also that's needed is like statistics <laughs> that's a horrible thing to say but when you actually look at statistics and then very often, I will say sometimes when you start throwing out statistics, you just end up in abject racism and I don't know what you do there. Like I have not yet figured out what you do um, other than calling someone a racist. Like what do you do when then they start spouting back to you? Well, you know, single parent households because black men are all in jail, which I will tell you I have heard <laughs> um, more than once. Um, at that point, I think you're at an impasse and you just got to leave it because there's only so much you can do if that's some the way somebody's hardwired to think. But I think really getting to the root of why they're feeling that siege mentality is so huge. And then explaining, I mean, another piece, if you haven't read it, Eric Ward, um, who runs the Western States Law Center, which is like the Southern Poverty Law Center, but in on the West Coast, um, has a brilliant piece called Skin in the Game, where he talks about how- yeah, I'll, I'll add it to the list of things that I'm going to send to circulate. Um, but it's a brilliant, brilliant piece where he talks about how actually what motivates white nationalism um, is anti-Semitism. And um, in the ways that I've talked about already, you know, the, the, the great replacement theory and all of these pieces, but also really talks about how therefore like you know, MAGA, as an example, is actually at its core um, a danger to Jews. Um, sorry if anyone uh, here professes that belief, but that is what Eric Ward says. Um, and I will, you probably know, I agree. Um, so <laughs> um, so just, being, just being really transparent, I'm a, I'm like a black New Yorker, like <laughs> that, that's where I come from. Um, from Staten Island, actually. So, you know, <laughs> interesting, interesting context. Um, so I will make sure that you get that. But I think, you know, showing the way, I love that that phrase that Eric uses of skin in the game, that actually this fight is our fight. Because quite literally, the second you start chipping away at some of this stuff, you end up, and we're seeing it very clearly, like in front of our faces over the last little while, um, that if you start chipping away, like, George Soros is funding Black Lives Matter. Um, like we're seeing it. And I hope that seeing it so starkly like that starts to move people along this journey. Um, the other thing that I have to mention, of course, is the conversation about are Jews white? Um, and I always jokingly say like, yeah, we're white with a huge asterisk and that asterisk is like two millennia of persecution. Um, even in this country that, yeah, no, this where I'm sitting to. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I think there, being able to grapple with that conversation, I think is really important as well. And acknowledging that you can both um, face anti-Semitism and still not face the same thing as black people face is so crucial. Um, and being part of the structures that perpetuate, um, which, I understand from the readings that you've been doing is essentially some of the stuff you're grappling with. Um, so I, I will say when I, I got sort of filled in on all of the work that you're doing, um, I called, my mother is, I jokingly say backseat co-chairing, um, her Holy Blossom has an anti-racism committee and my mother refuses to take on the role of co-chair, probably wisely. And so, so far nobody has, but the sort of people who are emerging as the co-chairs, um, I called my mother and the other person and said, you have to hear what this synagogue is doing because I think this is a structure that actually achieves the aims um, rather than like trying to hit the road doing stuff. Um, and, and, you know, so I commend you for that because I think it's a great approach to 
you can't you can't do the work of racial justice until you've unpacked your own role in it. Thank you, Tama. We'll head over to uh, Lou and then Stephanie and then Joyce. Hello, Tama. Thank you very much for uh, everything you've said. Uh, and a special thanks for the James Baldwin article, which I hadn't seen before and which is very powerful. A uh, couple of different things which are related, all they may not seem to be, and I don't probably don't have the time to tie them all together, so just bear with me. Uh, first of all, uh, I may not look like it now, but I am a blonde, strawberry blonde, blue eyed, not particularly Jewish looking Jew who was raised to not advertise my Judaism. My father grew up in the public housing projects in Williamsburg and Brooklyn, uh, the ones on the north side, uh, which means adjacent to Greenpoint, which for those of you who don't know Jewish geography in, in New York, uh, Greenpoint is, was in the 1930s solidly Polish Catholic and very anti-Semitic. Uh, as your experience in Staten Island, which people may not no is the highest per capita concentration of uh, Donald Trump supporters in New York City. They'll give you a little bit of that geographic flavor. But I've been taken to be non-Jewish on multiple occasions in my life and put in some very awkward positions as a result, as I'm sure you've encountered in being in or not in the black community. Uh, and uh, I have not always known what to do in those circumstances. So that's one thing I'd like to hear more about. Uh, the other thing is uh, to, to pick up on what you and Barbara and several other people said uh, is that we need, and we, we have, everybody's tribal at the moment, I guess is the way to put it, that people are all in a defensive mode uh, and we, I think it's pretty easy to see how we've gotten there uh, as a result of both political and economic processes. Uh, for those who don't know the, the Jewish history in, in Western Europe, uh, a lot of the transition from uh, what I'll call Christian anti-Semitism, theological anti-Christian anti-Semitism to this more generic anti-Semitism, political anti-Semitism that led to Nazism had to do with the economic liberation of the Jews of Western Europe, who then became perceived to be an economic threat to the German middle class. You have, you have in the late 1700s during the enlightenment and then the Napoleonic period where the Jews are given full civil rights is the first rise of political anti-Semitism, which ultimately just continues to grow for the next century plus into Nazism. Uh, at the same time, I'm trying to understand where the MAGA people and the people who attack the Capitol are coming from uh, because they're, they're, they're coming from some sort of position which doesn't make sense in a sense, and yet it does. Uh, Coming back to your metaphor or simile of the, the finite versus infinite pi uh, and the idea that these people feel that somebody else gaining their freedom is a direct threat to them and the life they knew. And I think we have to keep in mind, I, I believe in trying to understand who our quote enemies unquote are, because ultimately we can't just go around fighting battles all the time. We have to persuade people. And the policies, the economic policies that the United States followed in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s under both Republican and Democratic administrations and under bipartisan uh, rule in Congress was to shift jobs away from the lower middle class and underclass, white underclass in the middle of this country by shipping jobs to, to Mexico, even some to Canada, and certainly overseas. Uh, and so people start looking around, you know, who's to blame for the fact that our kids can't come home to this little town in Kansas because there's nothing for them to do here kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, thanks, though. Yeah, I think, 
you know, one of the things there's, there's so much to unpack and I think you're very right. These things are all connected. And one of the things that I keep thinking about is in 2016 when Trump won, right? There was like the big debate. Is it economic anxiety or is it racism that led people to vote for him? And I'm like, those two things are not actually that separate. Like you can't sort of pull these threads apart. And I think there was also like, again, I when I train, I always talk about, because people get their back out, backs up with the idea of like, oh, well, I'm a racist. I actually don't love the way that the language has evolved there because it allows people to say, well, I'm not a racist and not really understand that we're actually talking about two different forms of racism. We're talking about what I call the racism of bad actors, um, which is you know, what people hear when they hear I'm a racist and the structural racism that we all just like live in. It's not, not I mean, there are people who uphold it who are bad actors, um, but you know that that sort of understanding of like just where we're at, and that's you know when I think about that, um, I really think about the, that that piece of it. And I think you make a great point about trying to understand the other side. Um, and you know the other thing for me as a Staten Island, like Staten Island is my frame of reference. I vote on Staten Island, which is a very funny experience. Um, I mean, I vote by mail, but like watching the results come in, I will say when Max Rose won, I was actually in Japan, um, staying with my friend who is. Um, from like Westchester County and I had turned off the results for like a minute and all of a sudden from the second floor of this little Japanese house I hear him screaming Staten Island <laughs> I'm like what is he talking about um, and he's like turn on turn on your tv turn on your tv um and I was just like I'm sorry what um but also uh you know when we also think about the Black Lives Matter piece uh, of this all and how it all fits together Staten Island, I think, also has one of the highest per capita populations of cops. Um, so it's a really, it's it's a very messy situation for me um, personally. And, you know, my dad grew up with that. Um, there, there's an interesting divide in our family of, he he's, comes from a huge Catholic family. He's the second youngest. So the older kids were born in the Bahamas and like lived there to varying lengths of time. Um, and him and his immediately older brother and immediately younger brother were all, were the only ones born in the US. And actually the ways that they understand themselves are very different than their older siblings. Um, and so that's like, we get to have really fascinating conversations when I do make it to New York for Thanksgiving, because this is something that as the conversation about being black in America really comes to the fore. Um, you know, the parents, my, my dad's siblings, are immigrants, but their kids all grew up as Black Americans. Um, and so really starting to understand those pieces of it. Um, so all that is to say, like, we just have so much work of understanding and unpacking to do. And it's like a lot, <laughs> it's a lot. There's always more to read and I keep buying more books and I'm never gonna have time to read them. Um, but like, I keep buying them and from Black, black owned businesses wherever I can. Um, but you know, I think these are these are some of the little things. Um, I want to make sure there were a couple more questions, so I'm going to like two, two quick ones from Stephanie and then Joyce, and then we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much, Tim. Say one thing to her. Okay, now we're shy. Okay, I I, I think my, now we'll just be quick and put like a uh, exact. Um, example on like what a lot of folks have talked about and I owe Rabbi Lerner still like a two week old post Shabbat email on this but um, I have a really close family member and I'm really struggling with this issue that we're talking about of like um, well like yes um, I totally believe that there is racism and this is awful and totally supportive of all the work that I do myself and that we do um, with with our kids, like I was like, Dora, what are we talking about? And she's like, Black Lives Matter. I know. Why do we have all these books about skin color, Mom? Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, when I try to engage in conversations, I, I get really shut down with this person because much more concerned about the anti-Semitism and just like so much anger, mm -hmm. I think, and like. Um, you know, it, it is hard to even make my point because like, yes, I get it, racism, and I can't even deal with that because, you know, like I've been called out as a Jew. Like, you know, people can see me as a Jew and I'm like, yes, you can count those five times on your hand and that is real. But when you go outside as a black person, every moment, right? And I just find that 
it's hard because this person matters in our family lives and our children's and like there's like it's almost like the person who doesn't want to engage um but you know you really want them to engage and that's poor, that's like I take things very like this is part of my role to engage those people right and then can't I I come into a lot of those conversations a day each day <laughs> it's like this topic or another it's my role to engage like and to say those things but then also like getting shut down yeah and I think um you just it's a good thing that we're like on my computer because I'm making notes about what I need to send you after um but I think the Mark Dollinger talk um from the forward the other day so it was him it was Susanna Heschel and it was Gina Green um who is a black Jewish woman who does social justice stuff um and it it was a phenomenal talk. So I'm gonna make sure that that link goes as well. Um, but um, I think one of the things that is that is really hard and sometimes I think the only way through is explaining, is getting through that sort of core of like, actually this is about us too. Like we are not safe until everyone is safe. Um, I don't know how you break, like, as I've said already, I don't really know how you get there because um, the, the trauma is real. and. And I'm calling it trauma on purpose. I mean, Jews have good reason to be experiencing some pretty drastic intergenerational trauma. I mean, even like my family came to Canada, like I said, my grandparents were both born here in the 20s, but my grandfather came as a refugee fleeing, you know, depends what day you asked him. Sometimes it was the Tsarist, sometimes it was the Bolsheviks. I don't know. Like, we don't really know what they were fleeing, but we know they were on a refugee boat um, and that the joint um, wrote a letter to the Canadian government begging for these wretched refugees to be let into the country. And my grandmother's family came as immigrants. Like they, you know, got into the country through immigration means, but they were fleeing pogroms too. So, you know, even those of us who left sort of Poland, Russia, all those places as immigrants came as refugees in many ways. Um, so I think, you know, just taking that very seriously, um, that that is, that is our legacy and that is our history. And even those of us who weren't touched directly by the Holocaust um, were. Um, and so I think, you know, just being very sort of aware and cognizant of those, it wasn't that long ago. Um, and on top of that, being very cognizant of the fact that in the, that like all the social restrictions that were on Jews, um, housing covenants and quotas for universities and not hiring all the Jewish law firms and hospitals that popped up because you couldn't get a job as a do doctor or a lawyer. Like, these are real things. And I don't know how we hold up a mirror to people and say, it's not that bad anymore. I just don't know how we do that because we have learned that we're not safe anywhere. Um, and it might actually become harder the more anti-Semitism rises. Hmm. All right, our final uh, th a question comes from uh, Joyce Nelson. Hi, um, thank you very much for being so very frank with a, a very, very fascinating and, and um, thought-provoking talk. I, I did wanna um, ask you your comments on uh, the difference between Canada in United States when your parents fled New York and felt more comfortable in Canada. And I'd like to understand better, why do you think that is true? Is, is it because they have medical care, there's more equality? Um, so I, I'm asking you what you thought. Yeah, that's actually something I think about a lot because uh, people, because I talk so much in the US, um, and so much of the way that we talk about race in Canada is impacted by how the conversation happens in the US. Um, I think about this a lot. Um, there's a number of things. One of them is that um, Canada had a very tiny slave population. Um, we had slaves and like we are doing the reckoning with like what's named after the slave owners. Like that is a very real conversation in Canada as well. But the reality is that um, we had probably more escaped slaves from the US here than freed slaves from Canada. Um, so that's one piece of it, that just our, our history 
is very different. The majority, our, our Black community is an immigrant community that came on predominantly like domestic worker schemes in the 60s and then under family reunification. So that automatically makes it different. The Caribbean itself is just so different. And like my Black community growing up, I grew up in downtown Toronto. It was very racially mixed and all of my friends were Caribbean. Like that was, that's who's here. Um, you get the odd American, um, but for the most part, it's a, it's a Caribbean Black culture. Um, so that piece of it automatically makes things a little bit different. Um, the other thing is Canada enshrined a multiculturalism policy. It's not without its faults. <laughs> um, it's evolving. It's consistently evolving. But uh, Pierre Trudeau, Justin's, Justin's dad, um, actually enshrined it in our constitution. Um, that Canada is a multicultural nation um, and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms um, that grants all these protections is part of our constitution. My parents were actually already here when that happened, but that was the culture leading up to this. My dad moved into a very white Toronto, like Toronto was still pretty white back then. Um, Toronto is now one of the most racially diverse cities in the world. Um, which is very easy to forget until you have people who aren't from here coming here and they're like, whoa, um, you know, just even thinking of like my, my building, there's 10 apartments and I think half of the apartments are occupied by um, like black people, Asian people and Latinx people. Like it, that's the reality, more than half actually now that I think about it. Um, that's sort of our reality here. And then of course there are the differences in our economic, economic system, like healthcare is huge. At the same time, we are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, the COVID disparities um, are horrifying. We weren't actually collecting data about race in healthcare until COVID. Um, so we don't really know. There's a lot that we don't know. Gang violence is on the rise, gun violence is on, like all of these pieces. But compared to the economic inequality in the US, like it was just nothing like it even now, like we have an affordable housing crisis, granted, um, but we also have a $15 minimum wage um, and access to free healthcare that for all of its faults, and that's a whole talk for another time, like everyone's like, oh, Canada's so perfect. <laughs> I'm like, if you can build something better than what we have, please do. <laughs> but you know, the basics, we are not denied the basics of care. Um, and, you know, the, those sorts of pieces are huge. Um, and also just the way that actually integration is a priority um, here. And I think the the impact of Caribbean culture um, is just drastic. Um, that isn't to say it isn't without its challenges. But as an example, the city of the city of Toronto had a department of multiculturalism and race relations, um, which is eventually the department my dad went on to lead. He got his job there in 1985. And that was a government department that gave grants to organizations fighting racism um, that did that was policy advisory to city council. And that's, it still exists. I think it's called anti-racism and something now, but it was multiculturalism and race relations. Eventually it became access and equity. Like the language even evolved with the times. So that's just very enshrined in who we are as a country. Structural racism, as I said, still very real here. I mean, even like you think about it, you bring a bunch of people here on a domestic worker scheme and then family reunification, that's gonna entrench some systemic inequalities, um, but it's nothing like, um, it's just a shorter legacy. So it hasn't had the same amount of time to entrench itself in really egregious ways. Mm. Thank you. Tema, thank you so much. Uh, I think we went on an amazing journey with you. Thank you for spending so much time with us. Yashikoch, thank you for sharing so frankly with us. Thank you for the sources, the, um, the wisdom, the insights, the questioning. I uh, really deepened our learning and our experience. And again, for those who want to continue the conversation, we can do so on Monday morning as part of the community-wide MLK day uh, from 10 a.m. And then please sign up for the uh, Debbie Irving workshop, which is going to be on Sunday, January 31st from 3 to 5 p.m. We're doing it with many different churches uh, in the area, so it should be really interesting. Uh, there are limited spaces, uh, so please sign up for that. 
Um, and uh, wishing everyone a wonderful Shabbat afternoon. If you're coming back to Mincha, it's right here on the same channel. You don't have to leave and change your uh, computer. It's right here, 415. Uh, have a wonderful Shabbat afternoon, whether you're going for a walk. The rain has stopped here in Boston. Looks like a nice afternoon. So hope you enjoy it, whether it's a Shabbat nap or a beautiful walk. Have a Shabbat Shalom. And thank you again, Tema, so much. Thank Shabbat you for shalom. having me. It's been just a great conversation. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. shalom. Thank you, Tema. Thank you, Rabbi Lerner. Thank you for all you. We've invited Tema Smith, who's a diversity advocate, writer, and Jewish community builder. She is currently the Director of Professional Development at 18 Doors, which was formerly called Interfaith Family, an organization that empowers people in interfaith relationships to engage in Jewish life and to make Jewish choices and encourages Jewish communities like ours to welcome them. And I very much see that as an outgrowth of the work that we started as one of the first, if not the first, conservative synagogue in 1992 to create a care of committee to do this work. Uh, for her, this comes after seven years as a synagogue professional, most recently as Director of Community Engagement at Holy Blossom Temple, Toronto's oldest synagogue. She's a contributing columnist at The Forward, and her writing has been published in My Jewish Learning, The Globe, and Mail, and the Canadian Jewish News. She's dedicated to building a meaningful and inclusive Jewish community through research, training, writing, and relational engagement. Over the last 10 years, she has worked to advance the conversation about a racially diverse Judaism, working with organizations like B'chol Lashon, which we've invited to our community before, the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, um, the Miles Nadel JCC, CJP PAC, and conducting trainings and presentations for many Jewish organizations, including our own Boston JCRC, among many others. Um, she's involved in task forces examining the issues on the nexus of Israel and anti-Semitism in America. Um, and before beginning her career in Jewish communal service, she was a graduate student in religion and politics and early Judaism under the supervision of the former Canada Research Chair in Modern Jewish Thought at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, a place where my family is connected to through the Green family. So it's nice to have connections. Um, it was great to spend an hour with her earlier in the week where we shared many things, including a love of Peterborough and Bob Cajun, which are little tiny towns. But since I've gone houseboating there three times, I actually know those places. So we actually got to speak about that and fun bands uh, such like the Tragically Hip and had a nice conversation. I'm very excited to welcome Temo, who's going to speak now, as well as during Kiddush, and lead some Q&A there. We're really excited to go a little bit deeper. So Bruchaba, welcome to Temple Amuna and to our community. Hi everyone, good morning, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Um, I uh, haven't, I'm going to make a confession to kick it off. I have not been to Shabbat morning services in a while. I've been to numerous Kabbalat Shabbats, but it's very nice to be um, at, a, at a Torah service for a change. So thank you for having me and getting me uh, to shul, even if shul is my office. Um, but it's very lovely to be with you all this morning. Um, I am so, I, I, I'm going to just start by saying that um, for me, this work is political, um, but it's personal. Um, so just to situate myself in this conversation, um, I'm from Toronto, I grew up here. Um, my mother is, from Toronto, my grandmother is from Toronto. My grandfather's from Montreal, but you know we are sort of a many generation sort of Canadian Jewish family on that side. My father's side, on the other hand, um, emigrated uh, from the Bahamas into the United States um, in the, I want to say early 50s. It might have been 49, but somewhere around there. Um, and my father um, was born in Brooklyn, but raised uh, as a black child into uh, youth into early adulthood on Staten Island in New York. Um, Staten Island um, comes with its challenges for uh, its black population. Um, and so for me, um, you know, growing up very much in the shadow of hearing the stories um, of race and racism in America um, is very personal. 
um, growing up with the legacies of that um, is very personal. Um, and of course, um, having lived through Eric Garner's murder on Staten Island on a corner that is walking distance from where my aunt lives and where I stay when I'm in New York, um, really, I, I was always sort of engaged in this. I was always, my, my, everyone in my family works in racial justice. That's just like what my family does. I jokingly say, I just went into the family business in the Jewish community. Um, but it became even more pressing and personal to me when I saw the video of Eric Garner in a place that I knew and with a police force I had heard stories of. Um, and when I say stories, I mean the stories of when my father was falsely arrested twice um, as a teenage boy on Staten Island. So that's just to situate myself in this conversation. And for me, one of the big things that has come up as the Jewish community has really sort of engaged in this racial reckoning um, since uh, George Floyd's murder um, is a feeling of relief. Um, I've been trying to have this conversation in the Jewish communities that I walk in. Um, I began working in the Jewish community in 2009. So 12 years, I've been trying to have this conversation in various ways. Um, and a feeling of anxiety. Are we going to keep having this conversation? Um, and one of the reasons that I think I really feel this way is that for a long time, the Jewish community has seen this as a conversation about justice um, and about doing right by other people we live among. I'm not quite sure that the Jewish community has yet come to a point where we say, actually, this is about people in our community as well. And it dawned on me uh, when my editor kept asking me to write about George Floyd and I, I, was speech, I was literally speechless. I had nothing to say, which if you know me in real life and I'm sure you'll get to know through my talk today, that is not a thing that is really um, something that ever happens to me. But I had, I just could not come up with any comment on it. I just felt, just drastically overwhelmed. Um, and as I went through trying to process why I was so overwhelmed by this, I realized that it actually uh, tied back to a week earlier um, where there was an article published in eJewish Philanthropy, which is like the trade blog of Jewish professionals. Um, and then also in the foreword, um, try, that was a, an excerpt from the American Jewish Yearbook. And what it was trying to do was sort of say, okay, we, we had these studies that said that there are X number of Jews of color um, in, in America. And now we have this other study that is saying that we missed something and there's actually more. So let's talk about how many there are. Now, I always preface this by saying, I'm not a statistician. The numbers might be right on either end of the spectrum. And we're talking about 5% up to 20% is sort of the range we're looking at. Um, but for me, the issue was that at a moment when Jews of color had finally achieved a measure of visibility, the conversation had sort of finally awoken to our existence, there was sort of a pushback um, from the institutions that had systematically missed our existence. And that still is happening. And so this is the tension for me, is that on the one hand, um, we as a Jewish people, I think are showing up left, right and center for racial justice in America. And that is so encouraging and so um, fulfilling and rewarding to be part of that. Um, my congregation is reformed. So I was at the URJ Biennial last year um, it, where a motion on uh, doing investigations into reparations actually came to the floor and was passed. And for me, I was on the floor, you know, 6,000 Jews in this like conference hall um, or in this uh, convention center hall. Um, and I cried because it was just such a profound moment. And again, I'm gonna situate myself in this. My family's Caribbean reparations, if my family were ever eligible for them would be through the British, like it's a whole other thing, but a similarly complicated legacy, right? Like the slaves were freed, 
the British government gave money to the slave owners um, and not the slaves. Um, and, you know, the biggest difference though is that um, the way that the Caribbean evolved is just a very different picture. So this isn't personal to me and that like there's some stake in it for me personally uh, that I'll receive reparations, but just recognizing um, that that sort of level of thinking about the roots of systemic injustice in the United States was happening in a community that I belong to. At the same time, at the biennial, and this has been written about, I'm not sharing tales out of school, there were, there were numerous occasions where Jews of color reported um, at the best end of this picture, microaggressions, at the worst end of the picture, feeling completely erased and ignored, including um, a speaker who was told that uh, she wasn't able to pick up her credentials because the person who was speaking was the one, only the person whose name was on the tag was able to come and pick up the credentials. Um, so this is, this is the moment we're at, and I'm trying to sort of hold all of these things in. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading because um, the one of the privileges of being able, of being somebody who talks about this is that this week I get to teach a lot. Um, and I'm actually doing some text study tomorrow um, at, at a congregation in New Jersey and reading through um, sort of historic primary sources from the civil rights movement. And I came across this really profound line um, from Abraham Joshua Heschel um, that was delivered actually at the conference where he ended up meeting and beginning his relationship with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I just wanna read it to you because I think um, I, I wanna use it to sort of frame the rest of what I'm going to talk about here. So he says, to some Americans, the situation of the Negro for all its stains and spots seems fair and trim. So many revolutionary changes have taken place in the field of civil rights. So many deeds of charity are being done. So much decency radiates day and night. Our standards are modest. Our sense of injustice tolerable and timid. Our moral indignation impermanent. Yet human violence is interminable, uh, interminable unbearable, permanent. The conscience builds its confines, is subject to fatigue, longs for comfort. Yet those who are hurt and he capital H-E, um, who inhabits eternity, neither slumbers nor sleep. And then he goes on to talk about um, the courts and how many of us are, are like justice will take its course, you know, if something bad happens, it'll go, to, it'll go through the court system, et cetera. And he writes, righteousness must dwell not only in the places where justice is judicially administered, there are many ways of evading the law and escaping the arm of justice. Only a few acts of violence are even brought to the attention of the courts. As a rule, those who know how to exploit are endowed with the skill to justify their acts, while those who are easily exploited possess no skill in pleading their own case, in their own cause. Those who neither exploit nor are exploited are ready to fight when their own interests are harmed. They will not be involved when not personally affected. Who shall plead for the helpless? Who shall prevent the epidemic of injustice that no court of justice is capable of stopping? And then he goes on to talk about the role of the prophet and it's, it's a really brilliant piece. Um, it's quite easy to find. I'll, I'll make sure to send a link so it can go out to you all. Um, it wasn't what I was intending to uh, talk about today and I was reading over it last night and thought, ooh, this is, this is good stuff. Now, what I was intending to bring today was some words of wisdom from James Baldwin, who is, in my mind, a, a prophet, bar none, in American sort of society and discourse on race and justice. And what came to me through that is how Baldwin really tries to tackle the issue of anti-Semitism within the Black community. Um, and what he really tries to tackle is the idea that um, there is sort of some unique black anti-Semitism and he goes on a whole sort of root cause thing. And ultimately he says, well, yes, the, the title of the piece is Negroes are anti-Semitic because they are anti-white. Um, it's, a, it's a really beautiful piece to reckon with. Um, 
essentially what he says is that Jews get stuck in the position of middleman that Christianity has always given to us. And therefore we become the face, uh, he, he uses a word like the, we do the dirty deeds or the dirty laundry or something like that um, of sort of the hegemony in which we live. And he, he uses examples in Harlem um, of, you know, the landlord, the shopkeeper, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what was really profound to me when I was reading this is he also though, puts Jews on notice here. Um, and he says, um, where did it just go? Sorry, I've got too many things, too many underlines in this document and I just lost my quote. Here we go. He says, it is true that many Jews use shamelessly the slaughter of the six million by the Third Reich as proof that they cannot be bigots or in the hope of not being held responsible for their bigotry. It's galling to be told by a Jew whom you know to be exploiting you that he cannot possibly be doing what you know he is doing because he is a Jew. It is bitter to watch the Jewish storekeeper locking up his store for the night and going home going with your money in his pocket to a clean neighborhood miles from you, which you will not be allowed to enter. I, I, I read this piece like 10,000 times at this point, probably. That probably isn't even much of an exaggeration. Um, I come back to it very regularly and have over the years. And one of the things that I find so profound is when you read that and Heschel side by side, essentially what it's saying is Jews, wake up. Anti-Semitism is real. We all face it. At the same time, we have to recognize that we have now been afforded a certain level of privileges um, in America. And what that means, anti-Semitism will continue to be real. And actually, it'll continue to come from places like the Black community. But we have a position of privilege that we can use to do social justice work. And the only way out of anti-Semitism is to address the root causes of injustice for everyone. Now, this brings me back to Jews of color. And then I'll wrap up and we'll be able to talk a whole lot more about this um, because really I could like talk about this sort of thing for, I literally taught a six week, two hour a night course on this uh, just in the fall. Um, but um, what, bringing it back to Jews of color, we occupy this space between these two worlds and the issues that divide the black community and the Jewish people. And when I say the Jewish people, I mean our organized communities and our institutions that predominantly do not look like us. And I, I always feel funny saying do not look like us because like I see myself, um, but I, I also know in, internally how much I look like my father's family and know that it's an accident of genetics that my skin came out white, my brother is darker than I am and looks exactly like my mother's family. Go figure. Um, but we don't often see people who look like us and we have to live in this tension between our two communities, um, whether we're mixed race individuals or whether uh, like myself, or whether we are uh, you know, fully black people who happen to uh, be Jewish for one, either by birth or by conversion or by marriage, or whatever uh, sort of route into the Jewish community we've taken. And for me, what I always struggle with and sort of try to light a fire under us for is to really reckon um, and with that tension, um, that tension between um, wanting to protect ourselves from the ongoing threats of anti-Semitism, even that sometimes come from the people that we want to show up for, and um, wanting to be there for the people inside our community who are facing also racism, who also experience um, some of that tension with that privilege disparity between um, for lack of a better way of putting it, white Jews, white presenting Jews, whatever language we want to use um, on the one hand um, and black people in general on the other and our desire to pursue justice. And so this year, um, this all feels, I think even more um, urgent, of course, George Floyd's murder, but of course also, um, what we saw last week um, 
which is hard to believe that that was only a week ago. Every week feels like a year. Um, but what we saw last week with people storming the Capitol wearing Holocaust denial shirts, um, what we saw in Charlottesville, um, when they chanted, the Jews will not replace us, they didn't mean that Jews are going to replace white people. They meant that Jews are going to flood America with moral, moral degenerate uh, minorities um, in order to undermine the quality of America. That's what that's what that replacement theory is. Um, that you know, so <laughs> all of that is to say, at the end of the day, whatever privilege we afford, we are afforded, you know, suburban lifestyles, whatever it might be. Um, both uh, Heschel and Baldwin talk a lot about the, the comfort of suburban lifestyles. Um, whatever privilege we have been afforded um, is not actually safety. And our safety is tied up and bound to um, racial justice. And racial justice, of course, is for justice, and it's also for Jews of color. I'm just going to end with one short, um, sort of making it really personal. I started with the feeling of anxiety and excitement. And that's where I want to end as well. One of the things that has actually bolstered me through this really difficult year, and I, we're all in this extremely difficult year together. Um, one, of this, that, one of the things that has really bolstered me was watching my community wake up to what we've been trying to say about Black Lives Matter and racial justice in the United States. In the immediate aftermath of George Floyd's murder, I was getting phone calls from people I hadn't heard from in ages. Somebody sent me dinner, just all of these like really caring things that said, hey, like this is already a really hard time we're going through. Um, and then this happened and we see you and we see how hard this is. That has honestly been the fuel that has enabled me to keep teaching, to keep talking and to keep going. And so when my Jewish community stands up and says, I see you, I see what you've been trying to say, I see what you've been telling us. There is no underestimating the, the emotional impact that has had on me. And so what I really wanna leave you with today is by being here, you're showing up. By being here, you're standing up and keep doing it. Because what I've seen from my community over the last, I guess it's really only seven months since uh, George Floyd's murder, but it feels already like a lifetime. What I've seen from my community is a true change that says to me, we care. And I'm grateful. I really look forward to continuing the conversation with anyone who stays um, during Kiddush. Um, and um, want to wish you all a Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom and Yashar Koch, Tadaraba. Tema, thank you so much for sharing so beautifully and powerfully and movingly, um, especially bringing us in those texts from Heschel and from Baldwin, um, really opening up some light for us to have that conversation.